Welcome back to Deep Dive. My name is Ben Smith and it's my honor to be here with Pastor Sean Scarborough, lead pastor of Family Worship Center here in Lakeland, Florida. Our goal for these conversations is to dive deeper into the gospel of God as we unpack some key points from Pastor Sean's Sunday messages. Our hope is that this will be a catalyst for discipleship in your life and lead to more conversations with your family, your friends, and in your small groups. Uh, let me just for a moment set up this talk for today. And the purpose of this podcast in conjunction with the series that we've currently been in isn't to project any type of opposing view to facilitate a debate. Pastor Sean has made it evident since the beginning of this series that our goal is to preach the gospel, period. That we want to elevate the gospel message in people's life and illuminate truth. Um, this podcast is an extension of the message on Sunday. And in this series, your goal has been uh, to equip people with truth so that they can vote accordingly in this upcoming sure. election. Is that sure. right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I will say, though, the series can be challenging for some as we approach uh, this election. And yeah. yesterday I noticed that some people were offended. Uh, but you said something in staff meeting a few weeks ago that I thought was excellent. First Peter chapter 2, that Christ is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, but to some, a stumbling block. Sure. And you made a great point that a stone that isn't a stumbling block probably isn't fit to be a cornerstone either. So in hearing the truth of the gospel, some will be offended. That's not the goal, yeah. but it does happen. The goal is just to preach the truth. Yeah. Yesterday, we had several people who left offended. Uh, how do you approach such controversial topics? And what's your thought on people getting up in the middle of the service and leaving? Yeah, I don't mind. Yeah. I mean, it's not the goal. Um, I feel like we have that every single Sunday when we get to the end of a sermon or the end of the day and give people an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And there are people who do not say yes to Jesus and they walk out the back door. So that, that happens. Um, I think anytime the gospel is preached to your original point, it's, it's going to create a decision point. And when it does, we can either go with it or, or not. Now, not everybody who leaves uh, gets frustrated by maybe a gospel point. They might just get mad that you didn't support their candidate. Um, now, the reason why maybe you didn't support their candidate is because of certain positions that are against the gospel. But, um, you know, the truth be told, every person we have opportunity to vote for is going against something in the gospel. Yeah. So um, that's why when I say I don't mind, I don't mind that people get frustrated. Uh, I understand it. It's not offensive to me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why do you think, I think you said this at some point, you had mentioned the phrase uh, picking the lesser of two evils in a mm -hmm. sense. Sure. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, you don't necessarily think that's an adequate phrase to, um, to communicate what's actually going on. Yeah. Why do you think that? Yeah, well, because everybody's, everybody's going to have a, a more core issue than someone else is. So let's say there are eight gospel issues on the ballot, and this was sort of my example week one. Um, and one of those candidates is standing for maybe five or six of those core points, mm -hmm. and then the other one only two or three. So the lesser would be the one that's two or three. However, if those two or three points that they stand for are more important to them than the other four that adds, you know, more to the other candidate. Like, I get that. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for me, for instance, um, there are a lot of issues, and I, I bring them up. Uh, we have brought them up uh, for the first three weeks. But, like, the biggest for me is, is life, is abortion. That, that's the biggest one for me. So I'm probably on the side, I've never had to weigh this out, but I'm probably on the side if that was the only one there and everything else, even though the gospel says one thing, this particular candidate is against those, but they're for this one issue, mm -hmm. I would probably be more moved by that one issue than the others. So when I say lesser of two evils, it, in one way, yes, it's if there are, you know, who has more gospel points, but in other ways, it's who has more core gospel points. Gotcha. I'm going to jump in the outline here since you, yeah. since yep. you went there. Um, the church has been criticized on making voting seemingly on, on this one issue, abortion. Yep. Yep. But even in the political realm, I even heard a prominent uh, political journalist who isn't saved yep. make the statement that 
that is what voting has come to for a president, primarily on this one issue on both sides. Yeah. Both, both sides, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, both spend a good amount of campaign time and resources advocating their side of the argument on abortion. Yeah. Um, why do you think this above all other issues has become the prominent one? Because there's several gospel issues. Absolutely. Why is this the most prominent? I think life is most prominent. Yeah. I mean, we're here, we're not, right? Like the, the biggest issue is, are we alive? Um, if, if within uh, the Constitution or the Declaration, there is this desire to pursue life, liberty, and the, in the pursuit of happiness, well, the, what's the first thing we talk about? Life. So I think, I think life's a big one. Um, I think that's a big deal. So here's something that's yeah. interesting. Abortion has even become controversial in the church. Absolutely. Of America. Why? Yeah. Uh, I think it's more controversial that we don't want to talk about it than it's what we actually believe. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's controversial in regards to what we actually believe. I hear a lot of people um, that would never go vocal with their opinions. They have an opinion behind the closed door. And uh, in the church, everybody has an opinion. And most of the church agrees that abortion is wrong. Most of the church just won't say it. Those who are actually Christ followers. Yeah not those that are just attending, yeah. that aren't living a gospel lifestyle, they might not have the same view, but those who are actually, uh, who are living according to the gospel and yeah. have that viewpoint, they're the ones that, the majority of them, we would say, if not all of them, would say they agree with life. Sure. That they're pro-life. Yeah. Um, why, I, I mean, I, I, think the, I think it's evident why some pastors are not, preaching controversial topics as it pertains to the gospel and advocating for gospel issues. Yeah. But to put it in your own words, why aren't they doing it? Is yeah. it, is it a seeker sensitive approach? Do they want numbers in the seats or are they just, do you think there's just a fear? Like if I say this, I'm going to get hammered for this. Yeah. I, you know, it could be all the above. Um, you know, people have different strengths in their communication. Some people are just natural debaters they enjoy going into the word to see, okay, there are two options. What does the gospel say? And that's where they might put their emphasis in their, in their discussions. These churches are going to be much more doctrinal. Um, they're going to kind of go at the, uh, like, where is their gray? Where can it be debated? Where does the gospel really have to be sought for an answer to be found? Um, and then there are those people that, and, and this is not a criticism. Um, there are some people, they're just happy smiley people and surface level discussions that's all they want that's that's all that they engage in in their personal lives around the dinner table with their friends uh, over a game of golf whatever they just they don't engage at that level so if they're in a leadership position um, it's not that it's just seeker sensitive. That's the personality of the leader. Is that acceptable for a church to operate that way? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, it's not my call. Sure. That's um, right. so I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there, there are effective methods in those churches of people reaching the lost and yeah, absolutely. you know, who are we to say? Yeah. Yeah. So that, I think yep. that's, that's excellent. Let me ask this question again, by reminding everyone that I'm not asking this in spite. I'm not, try, I'm not trying yeah. to debate. I uh, believe there's a great principle in here, though, that will benefit the church. You said something yesterday I don't believe you've, I don't believe you've ever done before, which this is your third uh, political cycle, yeah. uh, presidential cycle of being in a lead pastor position. Yeah. And um, the only one that I've witnessed, because you were in Colorado for that first one, but yeah. the second one, 2020, you were here, and I, I don't believe I heard it, where you where you expressed your disdain or approval for candidates. Sure. Uh, but yesterday you said, uh, I, will not, <laughs> I will never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever vote yeah. for Kamala Harris. What changed? Yeah. Why now? Why, why yeah. are you expressing so boldly? Yeah, uh, because I would get criticism for not saying what I was saying. And that was in the 2020 election. Uh, we finished, and people, they understood my position, but they didn't know what, how is that going to influence you? Like, okay, you told us what the gospel says about these things, but at the end of the day, how does it actually affect you? Like, what are you actually going to do or not do? So for those people, those dots weren't easily connected. They were not easily connected. Hmm. And so I just assumed this time, rather than create confusion 
if there's going to be debate anyhow, there might as well be debate on clarity, yeah. not debate on confusion. And I yeah. think, honestly, that statement is what offended more people oh, for sure. than yeah. your advocacy for life yesterday. Yep. And, you know, advocacy for life in a church setting to the majority, you're probably preaching to the choir. You get a lot Absolutely. of uh, cheering and yep. hollering and uh, excitedness. But when you threw that statement out, I felt the air just get sucked out of the room. Yep. You know, but at the end of the day, again, we are advocating for the gospel. Yep. We're not we're not platforming a candidate. You've been big on this. The church has has been bad to platform candidates yeah. in its history. And that's where we're missing it yeah. is we're platforming a candidate. But the problem is, is that candidate is flawed. Yeah. And when we platform them and, and we are communicating, we're we're with everything that this person is and stands for and their character. But the problem is, is that they're flawed. Sure. We need to platform Jesus yeah. and the gospel. And I think you've done an excellent job of that in the 2020 series and in the and in the 2024 series. How do you deal with the criticism that comes from these types of series and the messages, the emails you get, the comments, seeing people in the middle of a message get up and walk out? Like, how do you personally deal with that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't really feel the... Um, I probably deal with it because I don't necessarily feel the, um, the, I feel the burden to speak the gospel. Yeah. And then because people ask, I feel the burden to say what I'm doing. Uh, I, I do think people have a right to know what their pastor is doing. Maybe every, maybe they don't have a right to know what everybody's doing, the person next to them or behind them. But I feel like they have a right to know. Uh, and, and let me just say, anytime that the gospel brings us to a place, like if you preach, take marriage and divorce. If you preach the gospel in marriage and divorce, people will listen. But until you take a position and you look at a couple who are married and there is not something that they're dealing with, like adultery in their relationship, and they just say something like, you know, we have irreconcilable differences, and you say, that's not an excuse for you to divorce, you, you have to figure it out and stay together. And if they say, is, is divorce wrong for me? And you say, yes, it's wrong for you. That will offend them. You've taken the position. If you preach just divorce and remarriage and you just say it, but you don't make it actually personal, nobody cares. So that's the point about when you, when you make it personal with a candidate, you can say all you want to about the gospel, but as soon as you make it personal, people care. Yeah. And so recognizing that, I know it's going to happen before yeah. I do it. So, and, I mean, ultimately, yeah. Jesus said, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. When we take a gospel position, when we preach the gospel, yeah. it's not, they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Jesus, ultimately. Yeah. But we are human, and we have, <laughs> we have to do, we sometimes have to deal with the rejection of, I got that. Yeah, right. and I don't, I don't think, though, that somebody's rejecting Jesus because they're going to vote for a candidate I'm not going to vote for. Um, I do think that they have to wrestle with why are they choosing the candidate they're choosing? Yeah. What, like, what's, what is the reason? And, what are my issues? And, and I would, and this is probably conjecture, but I would venture to say that a lot of people marry themselves to a candidate and, and don't particularly do so for the proper reasons. Oh, for sure. Um, on both sides. On both sides, absolutely. Yeah. On both sides. <laughs> yes. And that's what was running through my mind because I'm thinking of, of, of both instances. But, um, and then they get offended. When, when you take a stance on one side because, sure. well, this one uh, more co-aligns with the gospel, not, 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 not 100%, not yep. perfectly, but yep. to the greatest extent. So I'm going to jump over to this side. And then people get offended either way, uh, not because of the issues that you're standing for, but because they've already married themselves to that candidate yep. Uh, yep. for a variety of other reasons. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and, and even within the church, and that to me is a huge deficit uh, for the church, yep. for people to to marry themselves to a candidate, not based on gospel issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we're well in the series and you've covered things like border control, Israel, abortion, we just talked about and have given gospel perspectives. I'm curious, just in your perception as you preach, what response from the people from the church has come to, come to your surprise the most? Uh, I don't know that I've been surprised. Okay. You, you know, I don't, I, I think for the most part, you go into these knowing how people are going to respond. Uh, what I mainly seek to do with these is to get people in the church 
outside of their political reason for liking this candidate or that candidate and trying to give them the gospel reason to stand for this position or that position. Really, that is my goal. So if somebody says why, they can go to the gospel and say, this is why I do not support abortion for these reasons, mm -hmm. because this is what the gospel says about life. And they can just say it rather than, I just don't agree with the pro-choice or I don't agree with the pro-life position. And somebody says, why? I have no idea. It's what my church stands for. Why? I don't know. So if, if we're going to talk about anything like a, a national border or boundary, why, is, why does that matter? Does God recognize nations? Does he not recognize nations? If we're going to say we support Israel, why do you support Israel instead of Hamas? Like what's the, what's the reason? Uh, I think we need gospel reasons, Absolutely. not just political reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. And which brings up an interesting point. Do you think there are some within the church that interpret the gospel differently? So they, they take a gospel stance, yeah. but they interpret what the gospel says about this issue differently. And so in their mind, they are taking a gospel stance. They just disagree. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like the, it's black and white. Yeah, there are issues that that would be true of. Yeah. I don't think these are issue, issues. Yeah. Like when you I agree. say, you yeah, pick like, the biggies. Yeah, when you talk about Israel, I mean, it's very clear in the gospel. There's no gray area. Absolutely. This is their boundary. This is who they are. This is who God chose. I will bless those who bless Absolutely. you. I will curse those who curse you. <laughs> it doesn't get any more black and There's white. There's no than that. confusion there. God is not for immorality. Yeah. So if we're going to advocate an immoral lifestyle and we can support an immoral lifestyle through the uh, innocent killing of uh, the killing of innocent children like that's how we support an immoral lifestyle clearly anything that flows from that is very objected uh, objected against in the gospel mm. I mean there's the gospel raises major objections against the idea of immorality yeah so thus it's the cornerstone into some yeah some yeah law. for sure yep. yeah uh, a couple weeks ago so before my time 70s, 80s, yeah. huge emphasis on the return of the Lord. Books were coming yeah. out. Yeah. The 90s, the Left Behind series came out. I actually, my dad read those books, and I read the kids series. Okay. Of the, they <laughs> right. produced kids' versions. I don't really remember much about them, but I read them. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the, in the 2000s, the, the turn of the millennium, the, the shift focused. The, yeah. the, excuse me, the focus shifted, and it became more inward focused. Yeah. And Purpose Driven Life was a New York Times number yep. one selling book. Um, and that kind of became, let me work on me. Let me focus yeah. on me, which, I mean, there are things we need to, that we de do need to reflect on and we do need to work on. Absolutely. But what do you think caused this shift and where do you think the focus is today? Uh, as, as far as what caused it, I don't know. You know, you're, you're kind of young, you're in your teen years and the world just is the way that it is. Um, you know, it could have been economics. It could have been just media and popularity. You know, you go back to the, all the way back to Solomon and God said, I'm going to give you wealth and fame because you didn't ask for it. So I'm going to assume at some point we just began to really focus on the thing that society has always wanted forever, wealth and fame. I don't think it's new. It's just our ability through media probably allowed us to pursue it more than before. Um, so possibly, you know, that's it. We had to focus on ourselves because there, so, there had to be something about us that was keeping us from wealth and fame. So if we could fix us, we could, we could get wealth and fame. Um, maybe, you know. And it draws just, our attention. Yeah, for sure. Oh, this will help me. Let me, yeah. let yep. me look at that. Self-help. And, and I'm all for self-help, yeah, yeah, by yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah. I'm all you, for it. <laughs> you are. And, but you've, you've, you've also made that uh, point that that's huge today. Self-help books yeah. are massive yeah. On the market. We should be our best. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there have been three kings over United Israel. Yep. Uh, in the history of yep. United Israel. Uh, Saul, King Saul, King David, yep. King Solomon. Period. Um, Israel exists as a nation today, has borders, yep. has a government. It's uh, internationally recognized as a country. Yep. And they do have a man that's in charge. Yep. Uh, a president. You mentioned that the throne remains empty until Jesus comes back. Yeah. How do you differentiate between a king and a president? Yeah, just one's appointed, one's elected. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, simply, simply put. Yeah. <laughs> one's appointed, one's elected. Yeah. Um, can you go in, can you expound a little bit more on the idea of the throne being empty until Jesus returns? Uh, is that a... I don't think that it a, had to be. It just is. Well, I, based on the response of yeah. the people in obedience to yep. God, right? Yeah. Did... Uh, is, was it in scripture after the reign of Solomon when the kingdoms divided? Uh, and then you had Israel and then you yep. had Judah, the northern and the southern kingdoms. Um, was it, was it and, and forgive me for not knowing, does it talk about in that time frame the idea of the throne remaining empty 
as a united Israel until Jesus returns? No. No. Okay. No. But over history, we've seen that that's yeah. been the case. In the 1948, Israel became a nation again. The throne remains empty. And actually, the Temple Mount uh, remains occupied by um, Palestinians, by yes. not by Israel. Right. Yeah. Right. And so now we just wait for that moment of Jesus' return, and, and he will occupy the throne. Yes. And he will appear on the Mount of Olives. And yes. Yeah. yeah. What a glorious day. Amen. Does it? In my own mind, my, my, I've matured in this. As a kid, I used to be scared to death that Jesus was going to come back. <laughs> right? uh, as a teenager, I was scared to death yeah. that Jesus would come I back. I think we were all scared to death as, as teenagers. <laughs> yeah, but even now, it's, it's, it, I've matured in my faith, yeah. and that's the goal, right? You want to mature. Um, but at the same time, there's still this like, okay, Lord, uh, I want you to come back. It's going to be glorious, but at the same time, it's like, uh, I want to see my kids grow yeah, up a little bit right, more. Yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> And we're called to hasten the coming of the Lord, yeah. you know, to, to call that out. Uh, is it okay to, to want the Lord to tarry a little bit? That sounds terrible. That sounds terrible. But well, No, I don't think it's terrible. Here's why I don't think it's terrible. Um, God created the heavens and the earth, and he gave us the earth to have dominion over. He never intended on the earth to be a terrible place. Yeah. Uh, what, what probably, you know, you can go in, in, in even in the early church and there was so much persecution for what they believed that they had a greater desire than we probably have because of the amount of persecution. Uh, when you think that your children are going to be killed and or persecuted and or mm. whatever for the sake of the gospel, there's a different desire for him to come. Mm. When you're watching your kids win in little league or whatever oh, there's on. this like yes. let's keep going let's do this um so i i think there is a greater balance in our desire to see him come is because he said to us here's the prayer come quickly lord jesus so our response is in obedience to his he wants us he wants he wants to restore all things yeah. and we're not living in a restored we have no idea what that's going to be like. We don't and, have that perception. And when you consider that and that your children will actually experience that, mm. come quickly, Lord that Jesus. That would be the greater oh, desire yeah. if Absolutely. we could understand yes. what that would be. And, yeah. and, and that's why, I think that's why I kind of live in a both and moment yeah, sure. of like, I, I know that to be true, but I don't necessarily feel that to be true. <laughs> right. And, and so it's, it's like, I, I want it, I want the Lord to come back because I know all things will be restored and it'll be so much greater for all of us. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm enjoying the blessings yeah. that he's given me today. And so it's like, well, I could live in this for yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah. And there's hard moments, but yeah. it's a beautiful life. Well, that's what he, when they were in, when, when the children of Israel were in um, captivity in Babylon, I mean, that's what he told them. Marry, work, succeed, pray for the success of the yes. city you're in, like, do well. And then in 70 years, you're going to go back. But um, yeah, we're, we're just strangers in a strange land, right? Yeah. Like, we're just here occupying. So it should be good, as yeah. good as it can be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, on the issue of border control, you advocated for helping people. Yeah. But we can only help those who we can help. Yeah. We only have so much resources to expend. Yeah. Uh, you brought up $66 billion has been allocated toward illegal immigrants. $18.8 billion toward hurricane disaster victims, which yeah. we have seen over the last several weeks, um, the havoc that those hurricanes wreaked. Yeah. Three billion towards veterans, those who put yep. their lives on the line for our country to to keep it a wonderful and great country, uh, will help those who submit to the legal process of coming into our country. My question is, without neglecting our own nation yeah. and the people that we are responsible to, what other ways can we help those who are in a dictator-run country or those who are experiencing just insurmountable hardship because of living in another country where they don't have the same opportunities here? How can we help them yeah. without without neglecting our own? As a nation? So, like, as a nation, yeah, how do we help North Korea, right? Yeah. Like, dictator, they, they can't get out, no one's getting in. Um, there's not a whole lot of national opportunity to help. They don't really let us yeah, help. Yeah. So, you know, not a whole lot there. Um, when we're talking about a place like Ukraine that is being um, uh, attacked by Russia, obviously we have... Apparently, we have resources to give them financially. Apparently, we have military resources to give them that they can use. Um, so, you know, we're doing those things. If there's a starving area, we drop, you know, food drops and stuff. So we do what can be done yeah. um, at a national level. 
you know, at the end of the day, it, it, the most we can do is send missionaries and mm-hmm. bring the gospel the to gospel. these places. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I got. You have anything to cap this off? I don't. <laughs> come yeah. quickly, Lord Jesus. So <laughs> come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's right. Before these next two weeks. Do want to let everybody know, though, that we do have two weeks left in this current series as we approach the uh, presidential election at the beginning of November. Uh, we want to encourage you to come be in the house. If nothing else, just come, just come witness what's happening. Uh, because it's incredible. And not not that people are leaving. That's not what I mean. Um, And there's only been a few, by the way, that did that. It's not like masses of people are getting up. Uh, But Family Worship Center, we align with the gospel. And Pastor Sean is is advocating for the gospel and doing a great job preaching the truth of the gospel. And so we want you to be here and be a part of the gospel mission, advancing the kingdom of God forward. Uh, So two more weeks in this series. We hope to see you uh, this coming Sunday, and we'll see you next time on uh, Deep Dive Podcast.